Well, if you will, turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, we're going to look at verses 1 through 12. Paul writes and says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obliged to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor circumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying this truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brother, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. In 1787... As our country was in its early years and they were developing the founding documents, a number of men gathered together in what was called the Constitutional Convention. And those men were to put together documents that would be the basis for our government. They were anxious, and the citizens of the nation were anxious, and they gathered outside of Independence Hall in Philadelphia wondering what was going on inside and how it would turn out, wondering what was going on behind those closed doors. Are we going to be a nation under a king, or are we going to be something else? When everything was finally done, a woman walked up to Benjamin Franklin and said, Well, doctor, what have we got, a monarchy or a republic? And he answered, We have a republic if we can keep it. And his statement, If we can keep it, indicates that freedom is something that has to be fought for. Freedom is something that comes as a hard-won prize. Freedom is, is something that can be lost. In, in the political sense, he was saying we have to fight for this or we lose it. But in the spiritual realm, this freedom that we have in Christ isn't something we can lose, but it's certainly something that we have to defend. When we think of freedom... We think of political freedom or social freedom. We think of the freedom of speech, the, the freedom of religion, the freedom of press, the freedom to vote, uh, the right to assemble. We think of the freedom from oppression. And what it really boils down to in that sense is that we want personal freedom. We want to be free to do whatever we want to do without the intrusion of anyone else coming in and hindering that, whether it be people or parties or powers. But that's a far cry from the freedom that Paul is referring to. Because freedom to do what you want is a dangerous thing. John Stott says that the best and truest freedom is freedom from my silly little self in order to live responsibly to live for God and for others. Freedom from my silly little self, from the chains that bind me, that hinder me from living wholly for God. That's the freedom that we need. That's the freedom that Paul is referring to. And he says, Christ has given us this freedom in verse 1. For freedom, Christ has set us free. He set us free. Why? That we would be free. And he sets us free from the chains that bind us. Now, this is all merely an introduction. But let me give you five things that Christ sets us free from. He frees us from death. Because of the resurrection of Christ, death 
no longer reigns over us. Death has no power over the believer. For those that are outside of Christ, death is just an entryway into an eternal death. That is the final judgment. But for those who have been set free by Christ, death is, it has lost its sting and it is merely a blessing that ushers us immediately into the presence of our eternal Father. He set us free from death. But he also sets us free from Satan. The cross and the empty tomb, in that, Jesus broke the grip that Satan had on humanity. He has no stronghold over us, no authority over God's people today. Indwelled by the Holy Spirit, it's as if we now wear this no vacancy sign, where they're stating that there's no room in this inn for Satan or his minions. We're free from that. We're also free from sin. We were once slaves to sin, and our very nature was corrupted by the fall so that every deed and every thought and every intention was only evil continually. We were bound by our sinful hearts, but on the cross he paid the price for sin, and he gives us a new heart of flesh and the gift of the Holy Spirit, and through that power we can say no to every sin and every temptation, every vice, every addiction. We can now deny our flesh by the power of the Holy Spirit and live holy for God. But fourth, he sets us free from something else. Since we're free from sin, he also sets us free from condemnation. Paul writes to the Romans, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation for us because Christ was condemned on our behalf. He became the curse. He became the object of God's wrath on the cross, and now we are no longer destined for wrath, but for righteousness. There is no condemnation for us. And if that's true, then we can also say we're free from guilt and shame. We are forgiven because we are justified. And that brings us to the fifth freedom. And this is what Paul has been talking about in the entirety of the letter to the Galatians. We're free from the law. This is what he's been drilling into our hard heads over and over again. And that brings us to our first point. We must choose our path. And now don't get into a tizzy over that word, choose. Many of us who are of the Reformed doctrine, we, we hear that word and we get all about it, bent out of shape. That I don't choose him, he chooses me. And, but, but stay with me. Paul is writing to the Galatian church. He's writing to believers, those who have already been set apart by faith for God. And he's writing this to them, and he's saying that there are false teachers who have infiltrated your church, and they begin to seduce you with heresy. And Paul is confident, he tells us in this passage that we read, that he's, he's confident that they will turn from those false teachers and do the right thing. But right now, before them, there's two paths, that, and one they must choose from. And I know it gets, this is getting a bit repetitive, but I'll, I'll explain why in, in a moment. He wants the Galatians to remember, he says in verse 1, to stand firm in the gospel of free grace that he's taught to them. And he wants to help them stand firm. And he's going to do that by outlining for us in this passage the enormous damaging consequences that will follow their spiritual decision, especially if they opt to follow the legalist and the false teachers on their path. He knows that the Galatians are standing before a crossroads. Before them are two paths for them to choose from. On one side, they have the path of justification by works. On the other side, they have the path of justification by faith. And let me stop here and explain this. Because this is a church word. We've talked about this word many times, justification. But I don't want to assume that we all know what it means and we're, we're all on the same page here. Justification is a forensic term. It, it means you and I, every one of us, are guilty of our sins. We stand before God guilty. But you can be justified. Meaning that you stand before God having been declared innocent. So there are two paths. 
You can either be declared innocent by your works, or you can be declared innocent by faith in the works of Jesus Christ. And the false teachers are coming along and they're saying, well, you need both paths. Faith is good. You need faith. You need Jesus. But you also need to be obedient to the law. You need works too. And now Paul presents these two paths and he's saying, listen, there is no gray area. There is no in-between. You don't get to walk both paths. You have to choose one or the other. So let's look at that first path. Justification by works. Verses 2 through 4. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obliged to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. Where does this path lead? Well, first, if they accept circumcision... And that's what the false teachers are pushing on them. You must be circumcised in order to be saved. If they accept circumcision, he says, Christ, who died on the cross, that cross, that, 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 that sacrifice, it will be of no advantage to you. Now, the issue here is not circumcision itself. Circumcision itself is, is no big deal. Paul was circumcised. Timothy was circumcised in order to avoid giving an offense to the Jewish people as he and Paul minister to them. You have to imagine how Timothy's reading this. After being circumcised, he's now coming along and saying, wait a minute, Paul, you told me I had to be circumcised, and now you're telling these guys they don't, and that that just doesn't seem fair on my part. But, But he's telling them, okay, we're circumcised. It's not that big of a deal. That's not the issue. It's not the act of circumcision that's the issue. The problem is that they're viewing circumcision or any work as necessary in order to be made innocent before the eyes of God. If you do that, Paul says, Christ has no advantage to you. Christ has no purpose. the, The cross was useless to you if you choose that path. You're standing at the crossroads and you need to realize that you can't take both paths at the same time. And either you are going to try to be saved by your own works, at your own attempts of obedience, like circumcision, or you can entrust your salvation only to Jesus Christ. But if you you choose both, you you can't do it. It's impossible. You're going to make a mistake. That's his point. And if you do decide to take this path, he says, you better understand what you're taking on. You can't cherry-pick the laws that you want to keep. You can't choose the ones you want to obey and the ones you want to ignore. You see him make that point in verse 3. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he's obligated to keep the whole law. He's he's confessing to them, okay, the law says be circumcised, but if you're going to obey that law, you have to obey all the laws. Now this is... A heavy concept, and if you've been reading Respectable Sins, if you've read those first three chapters, Jerry Bridges makes a a, a great point to address this idea. You do not see in Scripture the command to keep God's laws, plural. What you do see in Scripture is the command to keep God's law, singular. So he's saying you either keep all of it or none of it. You don't keep individual laws. You keep the whole thing. This isn't cherry-picking, I like this one, but I don't like this one. This one fits my lifestyle, but that one doesn't. This one's going to be easy to obey, but that one's going to be a little more challenging. No, if we keep this path, if we take this path, we either keep it all or we're guilty of breaking it all. This is why James says, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. We have to obey the law in its entirety to be made innocent in the eyes of God. We literally have to be innocent, not just declared innocent. I hope you can see, as we've been working through the book of Galatians together, Paul is quite quite clear, you're never going to manage that. You're never going to keep every law. As a matter of fact, you don't even make it to two years of age before you've already broken the one. 
which means if you live to be 120, that means you can live 118 years of perfection, but since you broke it in year two, you're already guilty of all of it. There's no going back. And if you try to keep the law, there are dire consequences for you. He lists them for us in verse 4. Here's what's happening when you try to establish your righteousness based, or your righteousness before God based upon your efforts instead of the efforts of Jesus. He says in verse 4, You're severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. Now here's a head scratcher. People sometimes read this verse and they worry that Paul's actually contradicting his writings in other letters. They say, look, right here, in Galatians, Paul is teaching that we can lose our salvation. That there is no eternal, no longer saved. But we know that Scripture never teaches that. Scripture teaches that Christians, true Christians, who have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, can never be lost again. They have eternal life. He who began a good work in you will carry it to completion until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined. Whom, those whom he predestined, he called. Those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he will also glorify. Once you are a child of God, you are a child forever. No one can snatch you from his hand, John says. So what is Paul saying? Being cut off from Jesus? Falling from grace? Those are... Those are horrifying concepts. Being severed from Christ. What is this? Can I lose my salvation or not? All he means is this. You've been severed from Christ and fallen from grace if you try to be saved by your own works. All he means is that you can't have it both ways. You can't have Jesus and trust yourself. You can't rest your hope and salvation on what you do and then claim to rest on what Christ has already done. It's, it's one or the other. And if you choose works, then you're cut off from Christ because His works are of no advantage to you. And if you've fallen away from the doctrine of salvation by grace alone in Christ and you've turned instead to the works of your own life. In many ways, this whole section is pushing on us a very important question that we all have to ask, and I'm afraid that we would all have a different answer to this question. He's asking us, what is a Christian? And here we're confronted with religion again. These religious people are coming into the church, and they're saying the very same things that they're saying to us today. I walked an aisle. I prayed a prayer. I've been baptized. I, I carry my Bible, and I pray, and I attend Sunday school, and, and I tithe, and, and I'm a church member, and I do what church members do. And they're trusting that all of those things are going to gain them a right standing before God. And one day they're going to stand before Him, and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't I prophesy in Your name? Didn't I teach and preach in Your name? Lord, didn't I work with kids and do crafts in Your name? Didn't I sing and play instruments in your name? Didn't I paint and mow and build buildings in your name? Didn't I evangelize and go on missions in your name? Lord, wasn't I a trustee and a deacon and a pastor? Wasn't I a legacy member and wasn't I a founding member in your name? Didn't I do these things in the church in your name? And he will say, depart from me, for I never knew you. These people are severed from Christ because they never knew Christ. They, they have fallen away from grace because they've never experienced the saving grace of God. If you choose this path, trusting in your works, in your membership, in your actions in the church, trusting in the fact that you're a good husband or a good wife or a good father or a good mother or a good employee, a good citizen, an American for that matter, if you trust in any of our works, you're not going to find Christ and you're not going to find freedom. You're only going to find the binding chains of the law of sin, of Satan, and death. 
and there will be only condemnation waiting for you with guilt and shame because that's not a Christian. So what is a Christian? Well, look at the other path that Paul presents. That's justification by works. You're trusting in yourself. There's nothing but death and slavery waiting for you. So what is a Christian? It's this other path that we don't walk by our own power. Look at verse 5. For through the Spirit by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. Here is the fundamental difference between the counterfeit and the real thing. Between legalism and the true gospel. Between works and faith. Authentic Christianity is a gift of God by the Holy Spirit. That's what he says in verse 5. You are saved from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you've fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, he says, we do not save ourselves. The Spirit is the agent that saves us. And how does he do that? What does he say? For through the Spirit, by faith. If you think back to your testimony... And you really have some abstract thoughts about this. And you go and you really examine that day. None of us woke up that day and said, I, I'm really, I think I'm going to be saved today. None of us woke up that day and said, I'm really gonna, just going to buckle down and I'm going to muster up some faith. And I'm going to choose Jesus today. That didn't happen to any one of us. What happened was that the Holy Spirit called us, convicted us, and then gifted us faith. Instead of declaring ourselves innocent on the basis of our own works or on the basis of our religious efforts, Paul is saying that you receive innocence and you receive justification by the gift of faith from the Holy Spirit. The Spirit's gift is justifying you and it's saving you. Faith looks not to your own works, but to the works of Christ for you. And it doesn't trust anything that you do, any effort that you make. It rests entirely on Him who did it all and gave it all and bore it all for you and me. The Spirit grants us faith and faith justifies us. And notice what He says about that faith. By faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. What does that mean? Does that mean that I'm not righteous yet, but maybe, hopefully, Fingers crossed, one day I will be righteous. Is that what Paul is saying? No, not at all. What Paul means is this. If you've been called by the Holy Spirit, if you've been called to salvation, and you've been saved by faith, then you, as you continue in your faith, and as you're sanctified, you're going to have an increasing hatred for the sin that remains in you. And you will stop all of your efforts, and you will stop all of your works to be saved, because you know that even your best is filthy rags. And those filthy rags, as you get older, and as you grow in Christ, and as you mature in Christ, those filthy rags are just going to become more rancid to you. And you're going to hate them all the more. As you're sanctified, your eyes will be opened more and more to that indwelling sin that remains. And as you deplore that sin, you will long for that day where you will sin no more. Let me ask, because I'm sure this is another question we have all different answers on. What do you look forward to most about heaven? I'm sure we all have a variety of answers to that question. What do I look forward? forward to most about heaven other than witnessing the glory of my God and my Savior the thing that I look forward to the most is not the streets of gold or the pearly gates or the angels or, or the mansions the thing that I look forward to the most is that there's no more sin and it's not no more sin in anyone else there's no more sin in me that means that the, the there's no more anger. There's no more irritability. There's no more anxiety. Oh, that, what a relief there. No more anxiety. No more 
pride, no more selfishness, no more sloth, no more lust, no more covetousness, no more sin in me. I look forward to the day when I will be fully saved. You remember we said that last year. You have been saved. You've been justified. You are being saved. You're being sanctified. And one day you will be saved and you will be glorified. By faith, Paul says, I eagerly, with goosebumps, anticipate and wait upon that day with the hope of righteousness. I long for the day when I will not just be declared righteous, but I will be made righteous in the eyes of Christ. I have hope in that day that it's coming, and it's coming soon. And that hope is not a wishful thinking. I really hope it's going to happen. No, that hope is a certainty that God will complete the good work in me that he began, and I will stand before him fully conformed to the image of Christ. That's a promise that I cling to in faith that was gifted to me by the Holy Spirit. So then Paul says in verse 6, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor circumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. He tells us that if you are in Christ Jesus, it doesn't matter if you're circumcised or not. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, if you're in Christ. It doesn't matter whether you've kept the law of if you've kept the law of Moses or not. It doesn't, it just doesn't count. It's not a decisive matter. Instead, what counts is do you have faith in Christ? That's that's what that's what's gonna happen on that last day. You're gonna lay out all of your works, and he's gonna say, Depart from me, or I never knew you. Or by faith, you're not even going to mention yourself and you're just going to point to Christ and say, that man saved me. He brought me here by his blood. I didn't do it at all. I don't deserve to be here, but by faith I'm here because Christ brought me here. Faith in Christ, that's what makes a Christian. Faith. And he says, faith working through love. It's not an abstract faith. It's not an inactive faith. He says, only faith working through love. Now, we're not going to go in depth on that because that's really going to be next week and it's going to set the stage for the rest of the letter to the Galatians. But he's telling us, your faith works. Saving faith is a faith that works. Faith without works, James says, is dead. If you can look at a person and they profess Christ, but there's no evidence in the works of their life, that's not a real faith. You are saved by faith alone, but your faith won't be alone. It will produce Christ-like obedience that is marked by love. That's the rest of Galatians. And it's a love that summarizes the whole law. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, and you shall love the neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on those two commandments. Paul says the same thing later in, in our chapter, in verse 14. He says, the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Ask yourself this hard question. Do I have that kind of faith? So many of us, are trusting in a prayer, in a baptism, in a church membership. And if we were to ask, are you a Christian? If we were to go out into the community, and I fear if we were to go out into this congregation, are you a Christian? Oh, yeah, I've been baptized. Yeah. Well, that's not what I asked. Are you a Christian? Oh, well, yeah, I go to such and such church. I've been a member down there since VBS when I was 10 years old. 60 years ago. Well, that's still not what I ask. Are you a Christian? See, trusting in those things is the same as trusting in circumcision. Are you a Christian? Do you trust in the works of Christ alone? And does that faith manifest itself through loving service to God and neighbor? So here's a simple test. This is the hard question. When was the last time 
today, this week, this month, this year, this past decade, when was the last time you sacrificed and served someone other than yourself? Who was it? Who did you love enough to serve? It's a simple enough question. And, and we shouldn't struggle to answer that. And if we're coming back and we're saying, well, about five years ago, I helped a guy pay a bill. Mm, morality. It's, it's not works that are far and few between. It's works that mark our life. And it's works that are marked by love. They know us, John says, by our love. But look at point two. There's two paths before us. The path, the path of works, the path of, of faith and righteousness. The path of works, severed from Christ, no grace, only penalty of the law. The path of works by faith, or I'm sorry, the path of justification by faith alone is going to bring produce a faith that produces love that produces service but paul doesn't stop he goes into point two and says that we must beware the leaven very quickly as we deal with this one look at verses 7 through 12 he's telling us right here okay you've chosen the path you're going to follow now you need to be aware of who it is that you're following the Galatians have gotten themselves in the mess largely because they've been following the wrong people. They were led down the wrong path. Verse 7, you were running well. You, were, you, were, you started off strong. You were doing all the right things. You seemed to be genuine in the faith. But who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. He says you're going down a path that's not the one you were called to by Jesus Christ. You're, you're pursuing another gospel. It's not God who led you into these new convictions. You've been hindered by others from following the truth as you should. So how careful you need to be. And it's not just the Galatians. This is everyone. I think it's more prominent today. How careful we need to be about who we listen to and what books we read and what music we, we listen to and which ministries that we follow. There's, we're inundated with information. We're in the information age. Bibles, books, podcasts, music, sermons, conferences. We're, they're everywhere. TV channels. And everyone is, just, well, I'm a Christian, so obviously I'm good and I'm right and I must follow it. But we have to discern what's true and what's false. And he's telling us that a living, he says in verse 9, you have to beware of who you follow because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Error is dangerous. It spreads. It's like yeast in a dough. It doesn't look like much. It doesn't look like it's changing anything. But after some time, it begins to permeate the whole batch and you can see its effects. Error, Paul is saying, is living and toxic. So don't indulge it and don't entertain it. Don't think, well, I can pick and I can I can glean from this and I can discern from that and I can take a little bit from here and a little bit from there and I can I can I can I know what's true and what's right. He says, no, it's going to get in there and it's going to spread throughout your being. And if you're not careful, it's going to spread throughout your church. And before you know it, you're following a false teacher down a wrong path and you're severed from Christ. Here's why he says that we shouldn't entertain it. Look at verse 10. Notice the destiny of those who embrace the teaching. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. So Paul's, Paul's still perfectly confident that the Galatians are going to turn back and do the right thing. But he doesn't have that same confidence about these false teachers who are causing the trouble. He tells them, you can trust my ministry, in verse 11, rather than the unreliable guides that are taking you down the wrong path. Paul is still preaching the offense of the cross, and he's being persecuted for it. One way of identifying false teachers and false teaching 
What is in their message of the offense of the cross? That's going to cut out a lot of people today that you follow because they're Christian. The cross is offensive. The cross tells us you're not good enough. You're not strong enough. You're not independent enough. You can't do it. That's why you needed Jesus to do it for you. But what's the popular message of the mega churches and the, and the, the, the clowns that are scratching the itchy ears? You're strong and you're good and you're perfect and you can do it and you can be a little God and you have that power within you. That's not offensive. That's puffing you up. If the offense of the cross is not in their message, if they're not telling you that you need a savior because you're a sinner, don't follow that person. Are they preaching Christ in him crucified as the sole grounds for your hope and salvation before God? The majority of them aren't. Paul was preaching the free grace of God that flowed from the cross of Christ. And it was an offense to the false teachers and they persecuted him because of it. Never trust a ministry that omits the fence of the cross and minimizes the work of Jesus. But then Paul deals this, delivers this shocking statement in verse 12. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Paul's saying, I wish that those who love circumcision so very much would just go ahead and finish the job. You're so obsessed with cutting off foreskins, just cut off the whole thing, he says. That's his point. It's not a temper tantrum. It's not him boiling over and blowing up because he's been attacked. Paul is being deadly serious here, and he's using strong, harsh language because Paul's a shepherd and Paul's a pastor. And sometimes that role requires bold words. Sometimes in order to wake up that person who's sleeping, you have to speak loudly and harshly so that they see the gravity of the situation. This error has eternal consequences. So we have to get graphic and we have to get bold to get your attention here, he says. Remember the law of Moses. That's what they're pushing. You want to be saved, you got to obey the law. So Paul says, okay, let's, let's look at the law of Moses. This law that you love so much and that you insist upon. That law says that everyone who emasculates themselves, you're not allowed in the fellowship. And you're not allowed in the congregation of God's people. You're not allowed into the presence of God to worship Him if you are emasculated. Are you seeing what Paul's saying? Those who preach salvation by law, those who preach works-based salvation, salvation by circumcision, they're cut off from the congregation of God's people. Their circumcision is not a sign of righteousness, it's a sign of self-righteousness, which is no righteousness at all. And so Paul's judgment, he says, that religious badge of honor, that circumcision that you're wearing, your works, might as well be emasculation. And they might as well cut you off from God, sever you from Christ, fall, or knock you off from grace so that you fall and you're outside the camp of the redeemed of the Lord forever. So I hope you see what he's saying. He's painting this picture. If you follow them, you're going to be cut off from the fellowship of God. You're going to be cut off from Christ. So I wish they would go ahead and just literally cut themselves so that they're cut off rather than cutting you off and everyone going to hell. It's a strong statement that he's making, but he's using their own argument against them. If you follow them, there's no Christ, there's no freedom. I'll leave you with this. If you imagine a bird that's been kept in a cage for years, its wings are clipped, it's unable to fly, unable to soar, then one day, the cage door is left open, and what does the bird do? He hesitates. Unsure of that newfound freedom that he has, he hesitates, and he doesn't leave. 
He just remains in the cage. This is what's happening in Galatia. You've been bound by the legalistic rules of the law, but the door's been flung open. Christ has set you free. However, some of you are hesitant, he's saying, to fully embrace that freedom. Some of you are clinging to your old habits. The cage represents the bondage of legalism, while the door represents the liberty of Christ. And just as that bird must trust in the ability to fly and to go out there and take hold of that new freedom, we must trust in the freedom that Christ offers. We must leave behind the cage of legalism and embrace the boundless skies of Christ's grace. So let me summarize this sermon with one statement, because this, this sets the tone for the remainder of the letters. Chapter 5 and 6 are all about how to be practical, how to, how to apply the freedom of Christ. So let me summarize it like this. Paul could say this, you've been set free, so act like it. You've been set free by Christ, so live as someone who is free. You're a Christian. Act like a Christian, he's saying. And then he's going to go into two chapters of telling us what that looks like. What does freedom look like? What does faith and love look like? What Paul is saying to the Galatians is just as true for us today. There are two paths set before us, the broad and the narrow Two paths where you can trust yourself, where you can trust in Christ, and you can only choose one path. If you choose to trust yourself, that's fine. But know this, the only Savior for you on that path is yourself. And, and you have to meet perfection on that path. You have to keep the whole law. And with that standard on that path, you're only going to find slavery. You're going to keep working, and you're going to keep failing, and you're going to keep working, and you're going to keep failing. But if you have faith in Christ, Christ has set you free. And he's set you on another path. So he says, live free. Live out a faith that works. But know this, and this is for the believer today. Know this, your freedom is secured in Jesus Christ. It cannot be taken away. You cannot lose your salvation. But you're going to have to defend that freedom. The agenda of the world the false teachers with the false gospels, even your own sinful heart are trying to pull you away from Christ. But you need to be reminded that you are not justified by your works and your efforts, but by Christ. This is why this is repetitive. Martin Luther, this, I told you I would tell you why we're repeating ourselves. Martin Luther said this to his church every week. I preach justification by faith because every week my people forget that they're justified by faith. I don't doubt that everyone in here is in agreement with me that Christ alone saves. But tomorrow, go live your life as if Christ has saved you alone. Go live free and take advantage of that freedom. Even as the world and your own heart are trying to pull you away from Christ and they're trying to tell you to go and be strong and independent and, and find that ability within yourself because you can do it, stand firm in Christ. Because listen, it would be absolutely ludicrous from you to turn away from your freedom in Christ back to the shackles that once held you. You aren't strong. You aren't independent. You can't do it. But Christ did. And we have a great Savior who comes and he sets us free. So don't turn from him, but by faith, with the hope of righteousness, live free in Christ alone. And as Paul says, for freedom, Christ set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for Christ Jesus who came to break the chains of our bondage. Whether it be sin or death, Satan or the law, Christ has set us free for freedom. So Lord, give us the faith and the hope to live free, to trust wholly in you, to stop being so consumed with ourselves and our own failures and our own efforts that we forget 
the great work that Christ has done to purchase our freedom. Help us to live at peace in what Christ has done for us. And Lord, for others, because I know there are others in here who are still under the bondage of the law. Open their eyes to their, their vain efforts and show them, Lord, that all that waits for them is the curse and the penalty of the law. But there is one who became a curse to set them free. Call them to yourself by grace, Lord, please, and save them, setting them free as you have us. In Christ Jesus, amen. Church, let's turn to number five, How Great Thou Art.